So we have Ron yes. Mataya here today, and he's going to be talking about the fly babies and his fly baby. He's also a retired Boeing engineer, author, kid plane, sport aviation, several books. Anyway, take it away. Thanks for mentioning the books, because that makes this trip tax deductible for me. I appreciate that. Did you bring any? I didn't. People always think that the publisher sends you crates of free books. They don't. I got to buy them. They give me like five free ones and after that it's, it's all my, everyone for themselves. Uh, I'm not going to use the microphone here. I have got a fairly loud voice. I flew the original Fly Baby for like eight years at an Auburn airport without a radio. And I had one guy storm up to me once and said, I didn't hear you on the radio. What frequency were you transmitting at? And I said, audio. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I'm Ron Wantaya. In case you're wondering, the name is Finnish. Uh, people come from Finland. Uh, the name Wantaya actually means portager. Somebody that does very, very heavy, very strenuous work. And I figure I've adopted because I'm the laziest guy you'll ever see. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to talk some about the history of the fly baby and where the fly baby might be going. Uh, I, I have my own in here and I don't know if I've got a picture in here or not, but I got a video I'll try to run afterwards showing it. But anyway, 60 is kind of an interesting thing to say 60th anniversary because there's a lot of 60th anniversaries in the fly baby and the, the, the most recent one was uh, the EA contest. But anyway, I'm going to cover what a fly baby is, some of the history, talk a bit about the construction, show you some of the pictures of them flying and some of the issues, some of the variations that have happened over the years, and then what I like to say, go and fly baby in the 21st century because, you know, it's basically a 19th century aircraft otherwise. And that's what got me into it way back when. I've always loved antique airplanes, but we all know how much effort those are to keep them flying, get parts in them like that. And a fly baby is a modern antique. And I really enjoy that with my little continental engine that I can get parts almost anywhere. What is a fly baby? Well, it was designed as a safe, easy to build, easy to fly home build airplane that anybody could build. And it was never intended to be a high performer. And we'll talk a little bit about where that problems come up. Uh, there have newer designs meet the same criteria at the same or lower cost, but the fly baby still has advantages. Like I said, it's a modern day antique. And I just love going out there and putting on my little Snoopy hat and putting my silk scarf on and you all saw me in my leather jacket. But it's a good route to an affordable antique. Uh, the design's well understood. We know a lot, a lot about it. We know some of, the, some of the problems are. And it's the nice thing about it, it's a sturdy, durable airplane. My airplane, uh, it was, I did not build my airplane. The guy that built it uh, did a very good job on it, but it's 200 pounds heavier than it should be. And I fly at about 1,100 pound gross weight. Now you get something like an Avid Flyer or even a Peaton Ball trying to fly in a heavy wind, they have problems. But Fly Baby, you know, stock one is about 1,000 pounds loaded and it can handle winds unlike a lot of the more modern light aircraft. <coughs> so first we'll take a look at the history. <coughs> Pete Bowers, of course, is the guy that designed it. He never used Pete Bowers as a writing name. Anytime you see his name writing, it was Peter M. Bowers. And uh, guys in chapter 26 used to tease him and call him Pete. And so this is why I continue to think. Uh, he, was a, he was an airplane photography nut as a kid, built award-winning models. And that is actually the first fly baby there. If you look at the shape of the tail, and it's identical to the, uh, to the home-built fly baby. He sold articles to national magazines while he was still in high school. He got his engineer degree in the early 40s. And this was during World War II, and he got an aeronautical engineering degree and an A&P license on a wartime course that took two years. Two years for an aeronautical engineer and an A&P certificate. Now, you can look at that and say, well, he may not have been 100% you know, engineer to get him through that fast. But he was an aviation maintenance officer during World War II in the Pacific Theater. Uh, worked in aviation intelligence. Of course, perfect guy you want. He's got, he knows cameras. He can take pictures of the wrecked Japanese airplanes, catalog them. Went to work for Boeing after the war. He, started, he helped start Chapter 26, one of, my, one of the two chapters I'm members on. He worked on a couple of his own designs. He owned several antique airplanes. It's a famous picture of him flying a Curtis uh, biplane replica. He didn't build it, but uh, he... Uh, this was right after Boeing developed the first 707, the Dash 80, and he talked them into doing a low pass at, at um, Boeing Field 
while he flew above the taxiway with a pickup truck flying in formation with him. And I don't know if it's in here or not, but there's a beautiful picture of him in this little biplane with the Dash 80 going by in the background. But anyway, he was thinking of some more designs when EA announced a design contest. And they designed it. I just absolutely love EA has all the magazines available online now. And you can actually go through and find these and you can trace the history of the EA design contest. Designed to get an airplane for sport flying. Remember we're talking about late 50s here. So we're not talking about high performance airplanes, just something a typical person could fly. They wanted something a typical person could build and uh, have it low cost. That was, a, that was a big thing back then. And I have to laugh whenever I look at the plans. You look at the plans, right up to the last edition of the plans in the early 2000s, Pete says, yeah, just pick up an A65 at the junkyard for $400. <laughs> <laughs> and those are like gold now. But anyway, the announcement was EA was going to have the contest at the EA convention in 59, bring your airplanes, and we'll have the contest. They quickly changed it to 60. They had a lot of people interested in it, but everybody said, no, we're not going to have an airplane ready in two years. So it's $5,000 in prize money, and that winner getting half of that. That was pretty good money back in the 50s. So the first requirements are on the left here. Had to have folding wings, be legally towable, two place, required to have at least 50 hours of flight time. You were required to provide working drawings. And the plans would become property of the EAA. Imagine them trying that this day. How many people would go for that? Well, nobody went for that. So they did change the rules. Instead of just folding wings, it had to be towable up to 60 miles an hour. They eliminated the two-place requirement. They kept the flight time requirement. They, and rather than working drawings, is something that an average builder could do. Eliminated the plans property of the EAA. And then they added the requirement, aircraft must use type certified engine. And you can imagine today if they try to do that, the huge stink about that. People say, we want to put something other than expensive $400 Continental A65 <laughs> engines. But the EA kind of dug their feet in that. We want it safe. And those of you who were like, uh, watched my uh, EA webinar two months ago know how much the the safety level goes down when you get away from the certified engines. So it's supposed to lengthen size limits to build in a single car garage and aircraft quality, workmanship, and materials. And a lot of people are a little miffed about that too. They didn't want to have to use aircraft materials on it. They wanted to use just random stuff like a lot of people do nowadays. Pete had been working on what he called a jazzy runabout for several years. That was the first full-size flybaby with a fuel-injected C85 engine. And he didn't have any experience or the tools for metal. Kind of surprising for a guy with an A&P license, wouldn't you think? But of course, this was in the, uh, in the 50s. And so he decided to do it wood. He called it the Flybaby 2. And it was based on the aerodynamic layout of the story special. And I'll talk about that in a bit. He had a partner for that. Well, Pete was going to work on a fancier airplane, but the partner dropped out. And Pete bought what he'd done and made that for the contest. So where did the Flybaby design come from? During the 30s, Les Long did a trade study. I just love that. I'm a system engineer. I love trade studies. And he had one common airplane, and he put high wing, mid wing, lower wing, and measured the performance on it. And he came up and said, well, low wing is best. So he designed an airplane called the Wimpy. And you can see it there. Uh, Tom Story in Oregon built one. Remember that name, Story? That's kind of it. He sold it to George Bogardus. And if you're not familiar with that, that's the guy that came up with Little GB, one of the seminal airplanes in the home building world. Uh, it's a modified Wimpy. It was built by Tom Story. And he flew it from Oregon to Washington to help start the CAA to institute an amateur built aircraft category. I could go a long time on this, but prior to 1947, Home builds were banned in 47 out of the 48 states. You could not legally build a home built airplane. And what George Bogardus and the uh, American Aviator Association did is they got uh, convinced the, F the CAA to have a category that superseded all these state regulations. So you could have amateur built aircraft. And this airplane is now in the Udvrahazi Center. In DC, you can go there. I always get a kick out of it because sitting under the wings of the Boeing Stratoliner. Remember the one they ditched in Elliott Bay? 
it's sitting under there and it's probably getting dripped on and everything else. After he sold the Wimpy to Bogardus, Tom Story said, well, you know, that was a pretty good airplane. So he went, uh, teamed with Dick Andrus, who was just basically a pilot, not construction background, to build two-story specials, basically the same as the, as the uh, little GB. Scrap A65 inches and scrap tubing, and, and you know, Cecil Hendricks described how they did that. They'd go, to, they'd go to aviation junkyards, buy cub fuselages in the junkyards, take them to their car, you know, how am I going to put the fuselage in the car? They'd get out the hacksaw and they'd hacksaw the fuselages so they could fit it in the back of the car. And then Tom Story rewelded it all together. That guy was one heck of a welder. But anyway, this number two, the one that Anders kept, uh, was bought by what's called the Second Story Flying Club, bought in Seattle in 1954. Cecil Hendricks wanted to buy that airplane, but he needed three other members to be able to afford it. And Pete Bowers said, yeah, I'll buy a membership. And when Cecil could only find one other guy, Pete says, okay, I'll buy half the airplane. So that operated, the club operated until 2005. And uh, Dick Van Gunzen's brother actually bought the Story Special and restored it. And it's now in the, I believe it's in the Hood River Museum, both Story Show number one and two. So anyway, this is just kind of proves it. I always get a kick out of Pete because he almost never wore a helmet. You know, I can hardly walk to my airplane without putting a helmet and goggles on. You always see these pictures of that, that very distinctive square jaw in the story. And the thing that's interesting about the story, look at the landing gear. That is a welded landing gear. It's a very complex welded landing gear. Tom Story could do that. Maybe the average person couldn't. So basically, is a fly baby a wood story? Well, it's the same basic layout, but it's in wood. And you can't just say, okay, this is a three-quarter inch steel tube. I'll use a three-quarter inch wood long iron. You can't do that. So Pete had to do his basic design work just based on the outside plan form of the airplane, with what's called the outer mold line is the term I've heard. And no design data on the story existed. And uh, Due to the long, Les Long's work and the, proving the, with the story, Pete knew the aerodynamic layout was a good one and he duplicated it. One of the best stories about the, the, story, about the story is that they had taken it home back, this is back in the battle days where it was cottony and you had to recover the airplane every couple years. And I better keep myself centered in the camera here. Uh, they uh, put the wings on the, uh, put one of the wings on a pickup truck, take it back to the airport to reassemble it. And, you know, this is nitrate dope way back then, and the wing caught fire and burned to ashes. And there are no plans for this airplane. So they didn't, they didn't want to take apart the other wing. They didn't want to remove the cover. So they got their sticks out, they measured, they built an entirely new wing just by eye, looking at the other wing. And, you know, it's, which one is the Tony? You can't tell the difference nowadays. The first fly baby in 1960, and notice how the wing is cleverly covering half the end number. It's N13P, N13 Papa, and I'll get into what happened with that in a couple of minutes, but uh, this was Pete's 13th airplane design, and there was a reproduction process called Folio, PH or whatever like that, and that's what he was going to use to, to build plans for it. So here it is, 13th airplane design, a good shot of the 13P, uh, painted red and yellow, you know, the, the, the one is that, why has it got color? Well, you had the Dash 80, you had the first 707 was painted that color, so he picked those. And of course, there was a lot of war surplus dope in those colors. And a lot of the airplane was built out of war surplus material, especially including uh, turnbuckles. It flew pretty good, he had a lot of people fly it, but it wasn't quite as stable as he wanted. And one of the things about fly babies, if you can't tell which whether it's 13 Papa or 500 Foxtrot, the eventual version, the front of the cowling is your clue because the uh, had a yellow front of the cowling on 13 Papa. So one day the contest came in 1960. Let's get all the entrants forming in. How many showed up? None. <laughs> Nobody had flown off the 60 hours and there were only two airplanes that showed up. Uh, one was uh, Loving's pusher there and uh, Neil Loving's pusher and of course, Pete and the Fly Baby. So they postponed the uh, judging for two years. And you can see the, uh, the airplane, I think, I'm not sure which trip that was. 
towing because he, uh, you could tow it on the main gear, but that was hard on the airplane because basically the, the wheels are right underneath the instrument panel and every little jiggle on the road that's bouncing that thing up and down. There's no, There's no springs no, or... No uh, suspension, right? No, no suspension or anything on Fly Baby. It's just, just the tires. That's why my back is kind of hurting <laughs> the way I land. They flew it successfully for two years, a very nice little airplane, and then one of them didn't put gas in. And this crashed out in the mountain. And this was six weeks prior to the judging in 1962. Uh, so Pete had took the wreckage home and he lived a few blocks of Boeing Field. And he was just kind of looking at it disconsolately one day. And uh, two guys walked by and they were Boeing engineers who were on TDY from Wichita. And they had nothing but free time in Seattle. So you got these guys and put them to work and he built the new Fly Baby. And one of the best stories on that is that one of the, they had two local kids helping with the airplane as well. Uh, how many of you actually knew Pete, met Pete? Pete, the nice guy, but had no sense of humor. He's very prickly. He's very, very, you know, he, he thinks the way it's supposed to be. Now that's a system engineering attitude. I shouldn't complain. But he had the two kids in the neighborhood helping, and he ran those kids ragged. And uh, so they helped. And he put it on the trailer to haul it to Oshkosh. And they asked, gee, Mr. Bowers, can we put a Made in Seattle sign on the back of the Fly Baby? So all the way to Oshkosh, people know who made this. He goes, Pete said, yeah, yeah, go ahead, boys, go ahead. So they put a sign on the back of the Fly Baby saying, Made in Seattle by slaves. <laughs> <laughs> Kids were not too happy. Now what happened with the, the new Fly Baby? as he extended the fuselage by, I think it was 12 inches or 18 inches. And so he got the stability he wanted. One memory was driven, the horizontal stabilizer is eight feet across because that's all the width you can do right. for a tow. Right. So he extended the tail, got a little more stable, got the engine pushed forward a bit, and uh, it turned out real good. Is that it there, the one or two? Yep, that is, that is the one after the modification. And I've got drawings on my web page. If you look, there's a thing on 13 Pop. I, I talk about it. And I have two drawings side by side showing what the two planes looked like. But uh, So anyway, he took it to Oshkosh and he won. And they actually had 18 competitors signed up. Six were there. And you see the picture of them all there. Uh, the Turner T-40, there were a few of those made afterwards. The Nesmet Eves Cougar, basically a cougar with folding wings. And the Spezio two-holder, which was almost the same as the Fly Baby. From what I gather, it's not quite as easy to fly, and that was the big thing for the two-holder. And then the, the Trep Contester, which uh, I think is uh, the center in back, that was interesting because the wing didn't fold, it rotated. It had a big pin in the middle, and they just rotated fore and aft to tow it. And then the Lacey M10. And the question is, the Fly Baby cheat? Rules required 50 hours. 13 Papa had that. Did 500 Fox have that? It was kind of a different airplane. It used the same tail section, the same wings, the same engine, brand new fuselage. And, oh, six inches. Yeah, I've got it right there. Uh, the point is, is that you went to the FAA and say, do I need, is this a new one? Do I have to go through the whole process again? And says, no, it's just a repair of the old one. And he did document that in Sparty Aviation. It's not something he hid. Didn't cover it up. So if you look in the, there's a series of articles in 62, Pete talking about the Fly Baby, and the very first one, before the construction started, he goes through this and said, yep, FAA said it was good, so here I am. It set the standard for home belts at that point. You know, but before that, it was just, home belts, you'd get a sheaf of blueprints, drawings or something, and you know, there's an example of the Fly Baby manual right there. It is actually a step-by-step -step procedures with a bunch of drawings done by a guy named Jim Morrow. And the series of articles in Sporty Aviation, if you're a member, you can download those articles for free, and last year the Museum of Flight actually put the plans available for free download. You can download the second version of the plans. It's great. I really like it. Over 5,000 plans are ordered, and about 500 airplanes are flown, but there's some controversy on that. Basically, there's a lot of people, A, they were unhappy about the requirement for the auto engine, and B, they thought this should push the envelope. There should be some you know, magical high-performance airplane or something that anybody could build. And there was a lot of uh, 
discussion about that, a lot of controversy, and they cleared that up. They fixed that entirely on the second EAA design contest. There wasn't a second EAA design contest. So you can see it's been 50, 60 years and they haven't tried this again. <laughs> So this, I, I get a kick out of it. I, I look into the FAA production, the FAA registration as well. This is an example of production. I looked in uh, January 2002 for the year of completion in the FAA registry. And this shows how many air fly babies were, were completed in a given year. And you can see how that peaked in about 1975 and then dropped off precipitously. Because that was right about the time the RVs were coming on. Burt Rutan was getting the uh, Verivigan, the Very Easy, these other airplanes, KR2. A whole bunch of competitors came in and that really, that really to a large extent, quashed, quashed the uh, market for the airplane. You can see we're still completing about five per year to the year 2000. And now it's on the order of maybe two, maybe three per year. A brief look at construction. I love Pete. He took a lot of pictures, and so you can always find pictures of the fly baby or anything else under construction. See, it's built like a great big balsa model airplane. You know, that's what Pete's uh, history was in. And you can see the uh, the jig lay up on the set. You lay it lay it down on your workbench. You glue the front part real thoroughly, and then you hork in the back and touch the uh, rear long rods together. And there's a metal bracket in back that holds the fuselage. So it's really a fairly simple build. Back in the days when you could build wood with wood really simply and easily. Uh, wings are built like a Model 2. You got two wing spars, you have steel tube construction ribs, and then you build flat plywood wing ribs. And you can stack those up and run them all through the saw at the time. Now people say, well, can't you do a built up rib like a Pete and Paul? And, well, yeah, you could. But how much weight are you going to save in an airplane like that? Maybe a couple pounds, maybe that's important. But uh, one of the weirdest things about it is the wing tips. You can see the wing, the curved wing tips. That's one of the nice things about design is this beautiful curved wing tip. I had a, one guy talk about he wanted to build a replica Spitfire and I just pointed at the fly baby wing tip. Yeah, it's not a full elliptical wing, but it's very attractive. But uh, that is, it is amazing. It's about, it's about 10 layers of eighth inch cedar bent around there, laminated, glued. And you look at just about any fly baby accident, you'll see two things survived. One is the landing gear. Landing gear is incredibly stout. And the second are the wingtips. I mean, I come out there and I pick up the whole side of the airplane just on the wingtip alone. The wing bracing is a little weird. It is basically one circle. The flying wires come from one of the uh, wheel hubs into the wing, straps on with these little anchor plates to, onto the spar, into a single master turnbuckle in the cockpit, then around the other side to the other wheel, and then a V bracing with the axle in there. The landing gear is actually part of the flight structure on a fly baby. So you can't just damage a gear and go flying because that's the whole the airplane together. Now you take a look at the GB, the GB did basically the same system. The difference is the fly baby is, doesn't have quite the long legs, so it doesn't have quite the, the, quite the angle, that same purchase, that the GB did. And here's the thing I was talking about. You know, here's a couple of fly baby wrecks. And has fly, the, one on the, the one on the right, you can actually see the tip. It cartwheeled. You can see the mud on the wingtip from the cartwheel. And it looks intact. And look at the way the whole wing structure just ripped the whole bottom of the airplane out. You know, it's a very solid wing. And I think, yeah, the picture, the low, little picture on the lower side is the actual accident. This one was kind of scary because the pilot was in it and he uh, broke both legs and had trouble moving and he was smelling gas. Because, of course, on a fly baby, the gas is like a cub. It's right in front of you. Uh, but uh, you know, if some of you may remember the kit planes article I did that low-speed airplanes like this, it doesn't, you don't get fires very often from those kind of tanks. <coughs> the other thing comes up is wing issues. They're low cost to build and operate, but they aren't go-karts. And you have wing failures due to poor workmanship. I mean, you're, you've got wires that are holding 1,000 pounds each, and they're doing the nickel presses with vice grips. Uh, the neglect is a big one. One of the problems with fly babies is it's a cheap airplane. I bought mine for $10,000 back in 1996, and I would probably end up selling it for about $8,000 nowadays. It's very cheap, and the trouble is, just because it's cheap to buy doesn't mean it's cheap to own. 
It's like if you buy a 1968 Mercedes Benz and expect to get by cheaply on maintenance. You aren't because it's going to be expensive to maintain. And a fly baby doesn't want to sit outside. And what happened? There are two cases where they sat fly babies outside for like five years for sale. Nobody bought it. And then in one case, the guy bought it, got the engine running, hopped in, went up, started flying aerobatics. Right. And it did uh, rot in the lower wing area. And it, actually, half of the wing failures in the fly baby occurred during aerobatics. Um, the, original, the original fly baby we had in Chapter 26 as a club airplane. I had a guy said, yeah, I want to join the club. I want to teach myself aerobatics. And I just had to, no, no, go away. Go someplace else, kid, or something like that. Because Pete talked about aerobatics. I say don't, because uh, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's adequate for, for aerobatics. The, the, uh, the, the, the reason why you can see in the diagrams at the bottom, a biplane, you do cross bracing, and you can just crank those wires real tight. But the fly baby, the monoplane, you can't work the wires against each other. When you tighten the turnbuckles, it just pulls the wing closer to the fuselage. So there's always a little bit of slack on one set of wires. When I fly in my fly, baby, I can see the landing wires on either side humming in the breeze. They're not shaking much, but they are shaking. And the thing I worry about, if you're familiar with a maneuver called a bunt, it's basically you pull in positive G's, you pull up, and then you shove hard and go negative G's. And you can imagine the fly baby with this sort of system, it's going from positive G load to a negative G load, and it's popping back and forth a little bit. Good example, the picture on the lower right, uh, one of the wing anchor plates and uh, one of the things I argue with is there's a lot of advantage for Pete's standard wire bracing system because what it is, you have the wire come up, it hits a turnbuckle, and then it gets attached to the wing. And the eye on the turnbuckle has a little bit of slip to it. If there's a little vibration, it's going to damp that vibration. And what happens is the guy says, well, I'm not going to use those 1,800-pound cables. I'm going to put some 3,000-pound solid flying wires on it. But what it does is transmit that vibration directly to the wing anchor plates. And you can see uh, this, you know, uh, not too visible, but if you look right in the upper part of it, you can see lines. The guy that had this airplane chromed those plates, and you never do that. You don't do that. It messes with the, uh, the metal characteristics. But you can see the vibration starting in the little creakiness there. So yeah, so, so use the standard wing bracing system. There is an improved system, which I'll talk about, which shows it's right here. And you see, uh, you see the stock system here. You have these flat plates with the wires attaching. And what Pete recommended is putting these little plates on the side of the wing spar and having the, having the wing plates basically be vertical. And that's great because then whether it's a uh, solid or a cable type bracing system, still has a slip on there. And uh, we, on the Fly Baby page, we've got uh, pages, guys have done drawings of those to make it easy to do. When uh, Chapter 26 rebuilt 500 Fox in 19, 1982, they went to this system. So. Also, there's the spark carry through. You can see on the top, you can see the little uh, green plates going through, and that's what happened the one in Florida. The water collected in the back of the spark carry through and the fuselage rotted out. So basically, just to avoid that, you put these uh, reinforcement plates on. You put long plates on if it's a new airplane, if it's an older one like mine, you get these little triangular plates that go in place. So what's it, what's it like flying? <coughs> Well, remember, safe, reliable handling was a key to the fly baby win. You know, the judging involved people who didn't necessarily have a lot of time. Uh, over 270 people flew 500 Fox. Uh, Ross Mon, Chapter 26, some of you may remember him. Uh, his dad was a friend of Pete's, and Pete said, oh, you want to fly the fly baby, Ross? Just go ahead and do it. Pete didn't have any tail dragger type. And he just went out and taxied back and forth and practiced and had no trouble. And he's the guy who checked me out in it, for gosh sakes. And then, of course, 500 Fox was Tom Poberezny's first home-built solo. And that was like a 65, I think that was. Look at a modern light. The performance is about champ level. I flew in formation with a, with a 7AC champ and you know, outran him, basically. Because <laughs> he had a, he has an A65 and I had an 85. And, but with the drag and everything like that, they're roughly about the same. I, I learned to fly in a Satabria, and it's close enough to that. But of course, not as many people are going to be willing to fly fly babies these days. 
Five babies aren't bad for a tail dragger, but there's a little instability around 35 miles an hour. And when you accelerate for takeoff, it like this feels a little scalar to hit that. And when you land, when the tail's coming down about 35 miles an hour, it feels it there. And there's a video online you can find it, me flying 500 Fox for Cairo TV. And they filmed me landing. And you can see the fly beak go in, do a slip, land, and then watch the tail as I'm rolling along the runway in two point attitude. See the tail, the rudder going click, 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 click. And that was entire, I didn't even know I was doing that until I saw the video. I didn't know it because it was just that little narrow range. It's stable in roll and it's kind of neutral in pitch. You know, uh, Pete could have used another six inches in that on that fuselage, I think. You need a gap seal for the ailerons for better roll control, and that is basically duct tape. You disconnect the aileron push rod, push the aileron all the way up, put a long strip of duct tape in there, and you're done. And I replace it every 10 years or so. Like I said, it's a heavier airplane, does better in windy conditions. But of course, it's got that solid unsprung landing gear. There is nothing in the landing gear to absorb your landings except the tires themselves. And a lot of people, uh, we had one guy check, try to check out in 500 Fox for the club, and I was standing by the runway watch, I'm going to bounce, bounce. And what I recommend people transition to Fly Baby, do wheel landings for the first 10 hours. Basically, just bring it and paint it on. And I've gotten to now where I'm tending to do stall landings more, but it really handles a lot better if you, uh, if you grease it on. Like I said, that landing gear is hell for stout. It is amazingly strong. I uh, used to have a G meter in my airplane. Why, I don't know. The previous owner put one in. And I got too slow on a landing at Crest Air Park, and I slammed. I mean, I came down hard. I thought I was dragging the battery behind the airplane. I came down so hard. A uh, G meter went up to four, and it was pegged at four positive Gs. So it saw more than that. And I flew it home, landed, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with the airplane. The only thing I saw was the tailwheel spring seemed to be just a little more bent than it was before. So it is, it is a challenge, and that's probably why I've been flying Flybaby since about 1986. Uh, you know, a lot of people get bored, move on to something else, but to me it's always a challenge landing that, flying that thing well, so I get a kick out of it. So here's uh, one of the examples I told you about. There you can see uh, this was a fatal accident in California with the uh, engine out. And he crashed into the trees. And look at that intact landing gear there. And then you can see I actually took a picture of the G meter. It's hard to tell because it's at the stop. But you can see the yellow arrow is. And it literally, my, my back was sore for a couple days after that. It really came down hard. Some of the variation that Pete had. Floats is one. <laughs> he had that right from the start. He still had floats for his Aronka C3. And he first tried to fly in April 63, and that was just nine months after the EA contest. And he, uh, had, he some of you might remember, with the, might be familiar with the float ramp at Renton. And he got on the float ramp, you know, had somebody prop the engine, and he slid down the float ramp, and he hit the water, and the plane just went <laughs> like that. <laughs> and Pete being Pete, he surfaced, and what do you think he might do? Yell at help, get a rope, and he says, no, get a camera, get a picture of this. So you can see Pete posing on the end of the airplane. They had that airplane out of the water in about an hour. They had the engine running four hours later. <laughs> so he, uh, he did a little modification. And basically, the floats had the right amount of buoyancy for you float plane guys out there, but the, the buoyancy center of it was too far aft. So he basically changed the struts to put the floats a little bit forward. And that, uh, that actually worked pretty well. You can see there's airplane was taxi on the lake three hours later. Can you imagine if that happened in, in, these, in these days? Good gosh, you know, you'd have the news people stacked up and you had FAA guys fighting to look at it. And here you just uh, haul it out of the water, drain, drain, the, drain the lake out of it, go at it. In Lake Washington. Lake Washington. If you're familiar with the Wiley Post uh, seaplane ramp there, it's on, the, it's on the south end of the lake on the north part of Renton Airport. Yeah, so that picture is looking at the pickup truck with the. Pardon? That, that's what they They have the front end of the pickup truck with the. Yeah, so with the tines on it to haul the float planes around. So, anyway, it worked fine. He put the ship floats for forward, 14 pounds of lead in the tail. I always appreciate those kind of fixes. Then, a few months later, another pilot. 
tried to land on the lake and he wiped the floats off completely. And here you can see there's a little more damage. You can see the uh, turtle neck area is gone, the windshield is gone, and it's just kind of flopping around there. But for some reason the airplane still floated enough to be able to tow it back. So that was the last time it went in a land plane bone. And I don't think... Probably floats. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Probably float a little nose low. And this airplane is now at the Museum of Flight Restoration Center. And I encourage people to go to the Restoration Center anyway. It's really neat. But you can crouch down low and look at the Fly Baby, and you can see the steel fittings on it for the, uh, for the uh, floats on it. Where's the Restoration Center? That is just on the main entrance to, uh, to Payne Field. He always figured he'd do a biplane conversion of the airplane. Did he cut back the... Uh Original wingspan some when he added another whole wing? Well, it didn't add another whole wing. They added, he added two, new, two full wings. The biplane doesn't use the stock wings at all. The, the wings are about three-quarters scale of a stock flybaby wing. Okay, okay, got it. So uh, the, big thing, the big thing is he had to add a center section because one of the problems if you use just stock wings, you'd have a wing, it'd be right over the cockpit. And just think of a Pete and Paul trying to get it in the front pit. And you'd be doing that all the time. So he moved the top wing forward far enough to be able to, and then had to sweep both panels back. So, um, so you can see the biplane, you can see how good access there. He's got the notch and everything like that. So it's, it's a center section and four new panels on there. And there's some metal fittings that had to be added on the fuselage, but not bad. And uh, Pete never did finish the biplane plans. You know, he used to sell those with the plans. And it's a, there's a thing on there that said, yeah, I'm finishing the drawings. He never finished the drawings. He, uh, like I said, B, Pete was kind of prickly, and he, had a, he fell out with uh, the artist who did the original Fly Baby stuff. So you look at the biplay plans. It's got Jim Morrow about three-quarters of the way through, and then it goes to sketches, Pete's sketches. Sketches aren't bad, but obviously it never truly got completed. And there's even argument about some fundamentals such as the wing cord on this because now uh, you know over the years people take the uh, plans put them in copiers and they're copier errors they get bigger they get smaller whatever Pete in his original write-up talked about a parasol wing fly baby model 1c and he had actually a couple articles he's talking about I'm gonna do a parasol wing as far as I know no construction ever performed and it was just the same problem with the biplane wings you couldn't use the wing stock because you had to put the center section a little further forward so you could get in on it, out of the airplane. And of course, the Pete and, Pete and Paul is out there. Right. Why try to compete against that? Canopies, he, from the start, he intended the airplane to be able to take a canopy. And it's got the removable turtleneck. And there's just a picture of my airplane. I think maybe the only picture of mine in here. But that whole section removes, has a couple of clips like the old like suitcase latches. Click, click. Push back a little bit, lift up, and the whole turtle neck comes off. And he intended to have it so you could have you know, open cockpit in the summer and closed cockpit in the winter. Most built from scratch in one of the air. I only know one airplane where it had both units. So here's some of the canopy fly babies. And one in the upper left, most of you are probably familiar with, that's Tom Staples out of Victoria. And he built that airplane in the 70s and flew it for a long time. It actually has a, he was Canadian Army during the war and he came back with a Messerschmitt 109 control stick. And that what this fly baby has. <laughs> but you see little bubbles and other little canopy arrangements and stuff like that. Uh, around this area, you know, I grew up in North Dakota. So it doesn't get cold here as far as I'm concerned. I go flying in the winter, I throw, I have a B3 jacket, you know, the kind that, that's, the inside, that's a wool, sheep turned inside out, puts all the wool inside. And when it gets below like 35 degrees, I fly wearing that and then a balaclava under my helmet. But not a problem here, but obviously people in Canada need a little more. I do have a heater in my airplane. So Mike, Matt Michaels is the only one that had it. You could build it either way. And uh, this was kind of neat. He built this throwover. Most people want a sliding canopy like a fighter, but you've got a throwover one. And this one's easily added to existing fly babies. And I was trying to come up with a good technical reason to include these pictures, but they're just neat pictures, so I'll just briefly cover them. This, is a, this airplane was built in, uh, in, Victoria, in uh, British Columbia, and it was exported to Holland about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, Hans Tiergartner has that, and it's a very attractive airplane. And one of the things neat about it is look at the exhaust pipe. 
It's got one of those swift mufflers going back. They're very critical about noise in uh, Europe. Yes, they are. So he's got that uh, good muffler on it. And he flies that pretty, pretty often. This is one of the British fly babies. I always like these 1930s British paint jobs. And this is a different one. And this uh, just is one of my favorite fly baby pictures here. If the bales in the background weren't machine turned bales, this would be, you could do this in black and white and it looked like it right from the 30s. But it's got the light blue fusage of the silver wings and tail. It's just a very pretty airplane. There's uh, Drew Fitto from Victoria. And he repainted this airplane. It's latex house paint. And he, that airplane was done 15 years ago, and it's still in real good shape. He's very happy with how it turned out. But this airplane is painted like Montgomery's little uh, Miles Messenger. So it has yellow on the bottom rather than blue or gray, because that's what they did for training and some transport airplanes. <coughs> There's three of them up in Victoria. Unfortunately, none of them are flying now, as far as I know. What's the six cylinder? First one there. That's not a cylinder, that's an oil filter, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a Continental. There is a Flybaby running with a Corvair on it, so there is at least one six cylinder Flybaby. <coughs> that one's real cool. The Neil cool about this thing, he's got skis for that. You look on YouTube, you can find him flying in the winter in this airplane. So that's. Got bigger tires. Yeah, well, that's, that's part of it. You know, you put big tires on a Flybaby, remember, that's your only shock absorber. Yeah. So why not put a bigger shock absorber on? Um, <laughs> Stock Flybaby used 800 by 4 Cub tires, basically, air wheels, which were designed for airplanes without shock absorbing or shock absorbing gear. Um, nowadays, you know, those, those tires and tubes are like a thousand bucks a set. It's just amazing. But most people are using like six inch wheels rather than uh, five inch wheels, I say, rather than the, uh, the four inch Cub ones. And I've got 800 by sixes on my airplane, so it's roughly the same dim dimension. Although it doesn't have quite the thickness of air in there because it's got the bigger hub. This is one of my favorite pictures, not just because it was taken with a drone, but that's not Pete's original Flybaby. Jim Katz in North Carolina built a replica of Pete's Flybaby. And you can't see the number here very well, but it's November 502 Foxtrot. So uh, he just, I mean, he contacted me for the specific details because he was a award-winning RC modeler. And so he's used to doing these very precise replicas. So I've got samples of the fabric of the original airplane. I sent them to him and everything like that. And there's the Corvair powered one. I haven't heard too much from him lately, but Corvair should be a good airplane, a good engine on a fly, baby. They work on Pete's. I'm curious about the, uh, the rigging off the center of the axle. What's that? What's going on there? Well, that's how the whole system works. The, uh, the, why, are you, why, are those, why are you putting that? I'm just trying to figure out the dynamics of putting that, uh, those in tension, I presume, to bend the... Put some preload on the axle? No, that, that is for fl that's for fl taking the flight loads. Do you think about the wing? Pivoting from the fuselage, you can see the flying wires on the bottom of the wing going to the wing axle. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ones that's going to the center of the axle. Yeah, that, that one is just additional stiffening. Keep the thing from shipping back and forth. So when, when you land, the axle's going to want to bend, and that's keeping yep. okay, okay. it? Yep. It helps on that. Uh, Pete originally had a different setup on there. I think, yeah, he had a cross wire setup before, but he decided this was a little better because the axles will tend to bend if you don't have it attached in the middle there. And it's, that's Hans's airplane in the Netherlands, and it's just a pretty picture. Some of the variations. This is one of my favorite airplanes, Hans Gubert. Uh, he built this Flybaby biplane. He put motorcycle wheels on it. Because if the Flybaby doesn't brace the biplane wings through the landing gear. So you can put shock absorbing gear on a biplane. And that's what he's got. He's got bungee cords on there to do it. And he actually did a cosmetic change. You can see the rudders shaped differently. And this is registered as an RA, RNAS Scout number one. RAS is Royal Navy Air Service from World War I. And if you look on EA, EA you can do a search online. EA did a beautiful in-flight video of this airplane. It's just gorgeous. This is a biplane in Quebec with a belt drive Volkswagen. Everybody says, well, can't you put a Volkswagen on a flybaby? Not enough horsepower. They only generate about... 
50 to 55 horsepower and they get hot while they do that. And this is even, he's got a belt drive reduction in there and stuff like that. And from what I gather, this could just barely make it off the ground. And another guy bought it and he's putting a, a Continental on it. But he wanted like $25,000 on the airplane. And I was going, no, I'm sorry. A little much. This is one of my favorite. This is, you know, fly babies, you can do the cosmetic changes really nicely. See the fuselage, he put stringers on there to give it a nice round round fuselage. And uh, the interesting thing about it, it's a Navy paint job, which I like, but it's pre-World War II. You know, I love those pre-World II jobs. And it's for the USS Northampton. And the USS Northampton was a US cruiser that was sunk at the Battle of Sabo during the Guadalcanal campaign. So this is a nice tribute to the veterans out here. So it's interesting, it's cosmetic tail reshaping, and uh, he painted this airplane like the Royal Navy had some of their airplanes at one point. Very attractive paint scheme. You can look on there and look and you see both ailerons are down, so the push rods aren't attached. But this is a very nice airplane in, uh, in New Zealand. And the interesting thing about it is, where's the N number? The NZ number on the back is uh, like a Royal New Zealand Air Force code. It's not the official civilian registration number. Well, in New Zealand, Unless you fly to another country, which you can't do unless you have 1,500 mile range, you don't have to put the equivalent of the N in the registration. Forget exactly what it is for New Zealand, but it's like NZ dash something, and you don't have to put the NZ on there. So you see, when you see, a, see an airplane that has just like three coded letters like that, it's in New Zealand. This is one of the favorite mods out there. Two 5 baby fans built a Junker CL1 version <laughs> replica, quote unquote, using a fly baby. And the gunner is a dummy. <laughs> and it's surface mount, so it can be removed if you fly someplace. And the cool thing about it is they got the dummy attached to the rudder pedals. So when they fly, they can push the rudder pedal. And <laughs> but it, there, there's other subtle aspects on there. Uh, you, you'd see the dummy cylinder heads on top, and he's got a spandau up there as well. And then the, the wheels, not really showing up well in this, but the wheels are actually painted to look like they're little skinny wheels. Uh, the one on the bottom was the neatest one. Uh, it's a US one, and the guy did a full vinyl covering of the airplane that had simulated corrugated steel, which is what a corrugated, you remember steel or aluminum, the original Juggers CL1 had. And that was just gorgeous. You had to go up and you had to touch the airplane to verify that it was flat. That sadly was lost in a uh, running out of fuel accident. Fatally. And then the other one is uh, Mason, the lower right in Texas, with his fly baby, with his, with his uh, Bosch baby, we call them. Wrap up, let's talk about fly baby in the 21st century. Latter day antique is what it was supposed to be, but now it is an antique. I mean, I rolled my airplane out of the hangar, I'm right next to a the fence, and there's a car dealership out there, and I roll the airplane out there, and a the guy yells, hey, how old was that airplane? And I go, oh, 35 years? And he couldn't believe it was only 35 years old. It's designed using engines that have been out of production when it was designed. You know, the A65 was no longer in production. The C85 stopped in like 1965, and who makes airplanes out of wood anymore? It designed to take advantage of the federal surface, the surplus tails after World War II. Uh, one thing I want to clue you in on, if you look at, uh, the Flybaby uses, uh, uses 40 AN-130 turnbuckles, and uh, Flybaby uses, they, they cost back then, they were about a buck 50 each surplus, but in 2018, they were $35 a whack. <laughs> and they're up to over $50 now, because I, I we, rigged my whole fly baby last year, and I said, well, I'll replace all the turnbuckles. And I go, 50 bucks each? The clue for you here is the MS turnbuckles, because the AN turnbuckles were replaced by the military specification ones, and you have to buy them individually, barrel fitting, fitting, but they're half the cost of the AN turnbuckles. And of course, they're rated, and they use those fancy little metal clips to safety them, which Perfect. those are those are work great. You take a little bit of a learning curve to pick those up, but it's a little hard to talk people into a fly baby these days. Uh, person owns the rights, no longer sells the plans, has no intention to. Uh, on the hundredth anniversary of Pete's birth in uh, 2018, we started the, what we call PB100, and it's basically 
Flybaby has the complete building instructions for free in EA Sport Aviation, available for any member. You can download those articles for free. They publish the articles in a single book, and they've got that for download as well. And then we have published companion guides for like the first 10 of the 14. The rest are all adjustments and everything like that. So like EA Magazine articles are 60 pages total, 265 pages for the plans. And we got over 350 pages in companion guides. New drawings, the descriptions, alternate safety notes and everything like that. So it's a good way to go if you'd like to look at Flybabies. Again, you can, order, you can download the plans for free from the Museum of Flight now. So we've got them there, and you can, I've got a link on bowersflybaby.com if you wanted to get them. The trouble is wood is getting kind of rare. Sitka spruce is very popular in Japan, building furniture. Spruce is a nice type of material. I've only worked with it a bit, but it, it machines nicely, doesn't splinter, and it's light. Uh, other woods can be used, they still aren't that common. Uh, 40 years ago, just about any, any man had a home shop with uh, shop woodworking equipment, not anymore. I got a table saw, I got a band saw, but most people don't have that. It's the time to consider a composite flyby. Had a friends that built a long easy and I looked at that tube and a long easy and go, yeah, you could do a flybaby fuselage like that or wings like that. And then of course, what about aluminum? There's flybaby did fly with luscum wings. It was fabric covered and it was interesting that the wing spar spacing was almost identical. It's like an eighth of an inch difference. It was pretty amazing. You could do C-section aluminum spars and aluminum ribs fairly easily. And the JDM-8 by Murphy was designed, it was basically an all-metal flybaby. But it didn't go anywhere in that. I don't think they ever actually put it on the market. The engine, well, flybaby isn't the only one affected by the, the Continental engine. There were mounds of A65s back then, but they just aren't out there anymore. O200 is still sold, but it's a good flybaby engine but they're $25,000 to $30,000. I love Rotax 912s. I love those engines. Again, I've, I studied those for my accident report, and it was just fantastic. Uh, but they cost a lot of money, too. I'm hoping with light sport airplanes, be like the 50s, you get airplanes that are getting you know, scrapped out, and maybe you can pick up a good used 912. I've flown the Flybaby uh, Classic two-seater with a Rotec radial engine on it. They're heavy which bet it worked good on a two-seater in comparison. Seven cylinder. Uh, uh, that was the seven-cylinder one I flew. They have a seven and a nine now. And uh, Jabiru is kind of a high-revving engine. And you don't really want high-revving engines on draggy airplanes, but it might be a possibility. What about engi auto engines? Same argument that said don't look at auto engines in the visual contest kind of applies. There's no standard widely available conversions available. If you got somebody that knows engines, some car work guy, man, go for it. But the problem is there's too many guys that are reading something about, oh, go to the junkyard, buy a Honda engine, then bolt it in the front of the airplane. It's just a, it, it's a project equivalent in size to building the whole airplane. And of course, as I've mentioned on a couple articles and on the EA forums, it's a higher failure rate on it. Corvair is probably the best option, but shoot, they haven't made Corvair engines since the 1960s either. However, there are about three million of them still out there. Yeah, they still get the cores. They would have to work on a lot. <clears throat> so look at a Flybaby airplane without the Flybaby template. Do we need trailer ability? No. Not a lot of Flybabies are ever, ever, ever towed. What happens is you take the wings off and you put them on a trailer, but very few of them actually fold the wings and get towed. Uh, engine, I love that 0200D lightweight, the lightweight LSA engine, or the 912. Construction aluminum monocoque, two seats. Because all the time I get asked, what about two seaters? Oh no, there aren't really any available anymore. You add all these requirements together and what do you get? What do you get? Hey. RV12. <laughs> now, the big difference, the big drawback here, is we're not talking cheap anymore. Because you know, if there was an R12 equivalent that you could build, scratch build, It'd be a good way to go. But, uh, and again, those engines are expensive. The engine question will all be the main problem when you're talking fly babies. But, you know, the, the C85s and even the A65s are still going. Wrapping up, this is the fly baby that had the, uh, I showed you the one canopy and said it's the only one I'm aware of. They had, the, they had both canopies on it. This is the open cockpit version of it. 
It's open back because he didn't latch the canopy on one takeoff. <laughs> Lost it right after leaving the ground. CFI. <laughs> so he put the, just put the back turtleneck on it and flies it open cockpit. It didn't take the tail off. Didn't take the tail off. Yeah, rather fortunate there. And he put the pressure cowl on just because he happened to have one? Or? Some, yeah, the pros probably, yeah, the builder probably did it that way. And that's, that's one of the things up the builders either way. And a lot of, I, I've seen, saw one at uh, Oshkosh. It was really pretty. It had a pressure cowling. It had the wheel fairings covered like that. I don't like that because it puts vertical surface forward of the CG. But it's not far forward of the CG. It had wheel pants. It had fairings on the, on the wing wires. The guy was looking for speed at a fly baby. But it did look like a nice airplane. I'll, I'll grant him that. But yeah, that's really up to the builders. I, I love the, I love the uh, simplicity the open cowl gives you. Went, I like to call it the Winston Church of Home Built. It's old fashioned, it's not too maneuverable, not too popular among its contemporaries, but it performs where it's mattered. Uh, when his motto was keep buggering on, KBO, <laughs> and I think that's what we're looking at on the fly baby. And I'm thinking some of them are still going to be flying in another 40 years. So that's all I have. I'm sorry if I ran a little over. Awesome job. Thank you.